Okay, so this will be the uh, beginning of section two. Uh, this will have two cardiology sections. Um, this one here will uh, talk about a couple of uh, kind of miscellaneous cardiology topics, and then we'll go into hyperlipidemia therapy. So the first thing we'll talk about are cardiology antibiotics. Yay. Yay. Okay, so uh, the first thing we'll cover is going to be infective endocarditis. So uh, have you guys covered any cardiology topics yet? Have you guys covered this yet? Okay, good, at least started to. So we know that this uh, endocarditis is gonna be a bacterial infection of the heart lining or of the valve itself. It's fairly uncommon, but when it does happen, it can be pretty uh, catastrophic. So it's good to know um, how to treat it appropriately. We know there's uh, several risk factors for this, including things like you know advanced age, uh, men happen to be more prone to it than females, uh, injection drug users are gonna be a big one. We'll talk about specific therapy for them. Um, Things like poor dentition and dental infection. Like, why, why do you think dental infection would put you at risk for developing a bacteria? Exactly. So bacteria can translocate and get into the bloodstream and eventually deposit here on the valve. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, they'll certainly go into the types of bacteria we'll see for this. Um, then certainly, if you have like a prosthetic heart valve or something like that, that's kind of um, you know foreign material that just kind of uh, makes it more easy for the bacteria to to grab onto that and to start a vegetation. So um, typically the pathogenesis, you know, I'll cover this briefly, but you know, you have this formation of a thrombus or you have some sort of abnormal endothelial surface that the bacteria can grab onto. Um, and when they have these vegetations, that's it's really the, the crux of why it's so difficult to treat these infections um, because they have this kind of mass of bacteria and it's difficult to really penetrate that and get down to kill off all those bugs. And so we'll see that the, typically the therapy that you're gonna be administering, is fairly long compared to what you'll see with a lot of other infections. So, you know, seven to 10 days is a pretty common and length of uh, time to treat someone for an infection. This might be up to like six weeks in some cases. So the causative organisms that we're gonna be looking to cover with our antibiotics, so we'll see that Staph aureus is gonna be uh, representing about a third of the cases here. Um, you have some other various gram positives, things like streptococci, enterococci. Um, you also have a, a small number of these being uh, these HACET gram negative bacteria, um, which you, you will see the, the list here. Some of them are some that you're familiar with, some may not, um, but those are responsible for a minority of cases there. Um, we see fungi also being a possibility. What kind of patients do you think would be more at risk for having a fungal endocarditis? Say that again? Immunocompromised. Yeah, immunocompromised, absolutely. So you know cancer patients, HIV, things like that. So uh, basically you're gonna be seeing that uh, it's very common to be able to get uh, good culture results back for these. Cause again, you have a lot of these bacteria that are kind of being leached off into the bloodstream. And so in most cases you're gonna have over 90% of your culture should be positive for something. So that really should be guiding your therapy as far as what type of antibiotics to use. Um, in the meantime though, your empiric therapy, so before you have culture results back, um, really should be focusing on mainly your kind of heavy duty gram positives. Cause as we saw on that previous slide, those are your most likely organisms. So covering for things like MRSA and MSSA, covering for things like stress and intercocci. The, the cultures are blood cultures you're talking about. Yes, these are blood cultures you're going to be getting instead of like getting something right off the valve because um, obviously that's a lot more invasive. So because you have that seeding, you're going to be able to get blood cultures for these guys. So uh, again, because this is a difficult infection to treat, we would like to have bactericidal antibiotics uh, being preferred. So things like our you know, cell wall synthesis inhibitors are gonna be good for that um, because we don't wanna have something that's just bacteriostatic because you wanna be able to get rid of that vegetation eventually. Um, so initial choices, vancomycin is gonna be a great empiric coverage for endocarditis because we saw vancomycin is primarily covering what type of bacteria? Gram positive. So really, really good gram positive coverage, um, including MRSA. So that's really one of the big ones we're looking to cover there from that standpoint. And again, treatment could be needed up to six weeks uh, in duration, so quite a long time there. So let's say we get some of our cultures back. Now we can start to target our therapy. So we can look at things like, okay, what happens if it comes back as you know, viridin streptococci, uh, streptococci uh, streptococcus bovis? Um, these typically tend to be highly penicillin susceptible. They don't really develop a ton of resistance here. So in these cases, you can get away with using something like penicillin G. In some cases, you'll actually see continuous administration of it over a 24 hour period. Um, why would you do a continuous administration? Why does that make sense? based on penicillin. Yeah, absolutely. It's a time-dependent killer. So by giving a continuous infusion, you keep the uh, drug levels above that MIC for as long as possible. Either do that, you do four to six times a day because it's a relatively short half-life. Um, so you do that, you administer frequently in order to keep those levels up. 
Um, other drugs you could consider would be things like ceftriaxone. Um, you could either do the IV or IM. That one obviously has a lot longer half-life, so you can give once a day. Um, or you can continue potentially vancomycin, uh, especially if they have some other contraindication or some reason you couldn't give one of the other uh, medications. And then here, you can see gentamicin being used. And so, you know, you have a gram-positive organism growing. Why would I use gentamicin? Because gentamicin primarily covers what type of bacteria? Yeah, almost entirely gram-negatives, right? So um, what we're actually seeing here is this case of gram-positive synergy. And so this is a concept where you're actually using two medications in order to get, you know, kind of ac activity that's, you know, greater than the sum of either of its parts. So by giving a gram-positive, especially something that's working at the cell wall, you kind of loosen those bacteria up and allow things like genomycin to be able to actually get intracellularly a little bit easier and to have its uh, bactericidal effect. So you'll see that uh, genomycin will be given um, either daily or say in two and three doses throughout the day in order to have uh, better uh, antibiotic activity. And this is good because you can actually get away with shorter courses of therapy by giving this uh, synergistic combination, something like say two versus four weeks of therapy. Um, Obviously, you have to remember which patients may not be good candidates for this, so especially if they have, um, you know, if they're at risk for renal toxicity or ototoxicity, those would be ones um, you'd want to be careful for. Usually, the doses you're giving here of genomycin are less than you would see for um, other indications where genomycin may be the sole antibiotic you're giving. Um, so, you typically, you don't have to worry about a ton of accumulation unless they already have some kind of pre-existing renal disease. So um, if you have other streptococcal species that are being grown here, again, most of these are gonna be penicillin sensitive, so just follow your culture results. If it says it's resistant to penicillin, then you may need to bump it up to something um, else, like say vancomycin or, or something like that. Um, for enterococci, generally these will be resistant to penicillin. So in whole, you know, on the whole, they're generally going to be pretty resistant. So in this case, you can actually get away with using Synergy as well. So um, you can use genomycin plus something like a penicillin or an ampicillin or a vancomycin, right? So there you won't want to go ahead and use combination therapy right off the get-go. And then looking at um, if you were growing staphylococcus, so MSSA, obviously one of our anti-staphylococcal penicillins will be good here. Um, again, plus or minus on the gentamicin. Obviously, you can get away with shorter courses of therapy by using this energy. And then if it's MRSA, vancomycin is typically going to be your go-to. But again, by this time, you have culture results back, so you know the bug, and you know the sensitivities, and this is going to be useful to guide you towards one therapy or another. If you're growing one of these uh, these haystack organisms, um, a lot of times you'll see that um, they can be ampicillin susceptible. They used to be, it's a lot more, but nowadays they're producing a, producing a lot of beta lactamases. So in this case, you'll have to end up using something like ceftriaxone, ampicillin, sulbactam, which you remember sulbactam is what type of drug? Yeah, beta-lactamase beta inhibitor or ciprofloxacin, right? So those would be kind of your options for if you're growing one of these gram-negative uh, organisms. So obviously, you know, if you were growing one of these, you've been treating with vancomycin previously as an impaired coverage, so you really wouldn't have been doing much good. But hopefully get those culture results back and say, you know, 48, 72 hours, at least give you some idea of, you know, how to change your therapy. So if you had an injection drug user, and this is uh, a picture of me from the 80s. I'm just kidding. No, really. um, so if you are an injection drug user, it's just you know, kick that way long ago. Yeah, anyway, um, so the reason why we mentioned injection drug users as a separate group is because they're obviously going to be at risk for different types of, of bacteria here. So you see that um, a lot of times when you're injecting things, um, these guys are not necessarily the, the greatest medical professionals out there, um, although some of them might be. Um, so when they're injecting things, you're typically not using good aseptic techniques, so you can have things like particulate matter being injected, um, especially if you're uh, doing things like crushing up Oxycontin and injecting that. Like, particulate matter can get into there. Um, you can end up having tricuspid damage, a lot of skin floors being introduced here, and then even in some cases, because you know these guys are not using the, the height of, of hygiene, um, they end up having saliva being uh, mixed in there as well. So lots and lots of things that can be introduced into the bloodstream, which makes them just way more at risk for having one of these infections. So um, staph aureus you'll see is going to be more than half of the cases that are there, uh, which makes sense based on the skin flora thing. And then they're also going to be more at risk for having um, fungus and gram-negative infections as well. So those are really the, the big differences there. Um, so again, you're going to be using the same kind of empiric coverage, but then once your cult cultures come back, then at that point you'll, you'll kind of gear your therapy towards whatever grows. Um, the other group to, to mention uh, as a differentiator here is going to be those that have a prosthetic valve. Um, these are much more difficult patients to treat because obviously they have this kind of um, non-biological, uh, you know, uh, 
material that's in the heart that just makes it more susceptible for bacterial growth. Um, Frequently, you will have failure of antibiotics. It's just not that easy to get the antibiotics in a high enough concentrations to really get rid of the bacteria. So frequently ends up requiring surgery to have it just had the valve taken out and replaced. Um, you'll see that when you do have Staphylococcus grow, because of the high rate of failure, you end up using a triple drug regimen. So this would be kind of a unique case where you're using three drugs for one infection. So here you would use something like nafcillin or oxacillin, which again is going to be covering what type of bug? Well, gram positive, but more specifically, yeah, yeah staph. So MSSA specifically. Um, cefazolin, which again is going to be what type of drug? You guys remember what generation? It's a first generation. It's ANCEF, which again is going to be your, so your, your go-to IV first generation cephalosporin. Or vancomycin. So again, vancomycin is usually going to be your first go-to one there. Um, and then plus a drug called uh, rifampin, which we haven't talked about. We'll have another slide on that. Plus genomycin. So by using all three of these together, you're hopefully trying to get a better kill rate and hopefully going to be able to get um, better results and eradicate that infection rather than having to go through uh, and have surgery done. So rifampin um, is interesting because it has this kind of unique ability to kill staphylococci that are adhering to foreign materials. So that's why they're really good for this type of indication, specifically with prosthetic heart valves. Um, resistance is pretty uh, quickly gained by the bacteria. So uh, when you're initiating triple drug therapy, it's really important that you start this one last. So that way you're kind of uh, starting to suppress the bacteria with things like the vancomycin and the genomycin, and then you add on the rifampin as a, as a last agent. Otherwise, if you start it first, you run the risk of having resistance pop up and then uh, it may uh, lead to higher rates of failure. So again, this one should be started last. Um, its mechanism is that it works by inhibiting bacterial RNA polymerase, and then by doing that, you're uh, blocking transcription, blocking protein production, things like that. Um, and frequently, you'll also see it being used in cases of tuberculosis. So when we talk about our pulmonary section, the struggle will come up again. Um, as far as adverse effects go, some of the big ones to look at is that it will cause red and orange discoloration of uh, basically all of your excretions. So anytime you have something that changes the color of someone's urine, sweat, poop, anything like that, it's really, really important to let them know about that because that's a big warning sign for a lot of people. You know, if you start peeing red all of a sudden, you should probably have been warned about that beforehand, otherwise you're going to freak out. Um, uh, the other thing to mention about rifampin is it is really a big inducer of a lot of CYP enzymes. So especially things like CYP3A4, it's a big inducer of that. So it can actually drive your levels down of a lot of other medications that might be metabolized by CYP3A4. So that is another unique thing about rifampin. Okay, so as far as endocarditis pr prophylaxis, so you know before you even get the infection, we like to prevent you from having that develop. Um, we don't really have a ton of clinical data to say that this is going to work 100%, but this is more of a theoretical thing, and hopefully it's going to cause more, more good than harm. Um, and so essentially, we're trying to give antibiotics to prevent the kind of preceding bacteremia before you can have that vegetation form. So we'll do this in our really high risk patients. So certainly those that have had a prosthetic heart valve placed, those would be your high risk patient. They have a history of infecto in, infective endocarditis, some kind of congenital heart disease, uh, which they may have an altered anatomy that makes them more prone to have these vegetation start. Um, or if they have any kind of valvulopathy in, in a transplanted heart, there might be another patient who'd want to uh, pre-treat as well. Uh, the things that you typically want to pre-treat with, uh, again, we mentioned the dental work previously, but anything other than a, uh, you know, a non-routine cleaning, you definitely want to uh, give some antibiotics beforehand. So things like you know, anytime you're having uh, gingival tissue manipulation or any kind of perforation of the oral mucosa, that's a huge way to have bacteria translocate into the bloodstream, so we want to prevent that if we can. Um, also, if you're having any procedures done in the respiratory tract uh, or skin musculoskeletal tissue um, manipulation can also be another risk factor as well. So typically what you see done is you'll have patients who will take their medication 30 to 60 minutes prior to the procedure, similar to how you would see with like a um, um, like surgical prophylaxis in, in the OR realm. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see like amoxicillin being used very commonly. So if you ever see you know a patient with a prescription for amoxicillin for like a one-time dose, that's typically what it's for. Um, if they were to have an allergy or some reason they couldn't take amoxicillin, certainly something like cephalaxin, clindamycin, or azithromycin would be your alternative agents um, that could be prescribed for that situation. Any questions on endocarditis? Okay, almost done with antibiotics. Um, the next part, we'll talk about rheumatic fever. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about strep pharyngitis.
Um, essentially, though, this is kind of one of those complications that you can have secondary to a strep pharyngitis, this acute rheumatic fever. Um, again, usually group A strep is going to be one of the big causative organisms, and you'll see it happening two to three weeks after the pharyngitis. So they'll come down with arthritis. Um, you have these subcule nodules that can happen, the carditis. Those are the really the, the big thing you worry about is the carditis. Because especially outside of the, the developed world, you can see this is one of the leading cause of cardiovascular death within the first five decades of life, right? So fortunately not here because we have good medical treatment, but in other places you might see this become much more common. Um, Obviously, the treatment that we're going to use for this is use your antibiotic treatment. So something like amoxicillin is a you know, really good way to, to treat the strep pharyngitis. And then afterwards, you may have to help uh, work with the, the complications of that. So if they develop heart failure secondary to this, obviously, we'll talk about the heart failure medications we'll be using. Um, then also worrying about things like anti-inflammatory uh, medications. So dealing with all the inflammation that's occurring because of this. So typically, what you'll end up seeing is really high-dose anti-inflammatories of things like aspirin. So um, again, like we mentioned, um, for that group A beta hemolytic strep, um, amoxicillin, penicillin are gonna be kind of your go-to drugs for that. Um, we'll talk about CHF treatment later on. In some cases, you may even need valve surgery in order to deal with some of the after effects of this rheumatic fever. And then we'll also be giving high dose aspirin, so anywhere between four to eight grams a day, it may see being administered for this. And then essentially you're just gonna be treating uh, until you have a resolution of symptoms. Um, but in some cases you may even need more kind of potent anti-inflammatory action. So we can use something like a prednisone or some other corticosteroid to help kind of tamp that down until it's kind of resolved. What do you give to kids? Um, so again, uh, this is actually a good question because it's come up previously, um, but aspirin is not absolutely always contraindicated in children. It's just we routinely do not recommend it for children. So something like Kaw uh, Kawasaki's disease, like the go-to treatment for that is aspirin, <coughs> right? So the main thing is to make sure your kids are not post-viral, right? Because that's when you're really at the high risk for Ray syndrome. So if you had this case where a kid had, you know, positive strep, like you had the culture result that showed that, um, and you're having this acute rheumatic fever, like this would certainly be indicated at that point. Okay, so moving on, any questions on that stuff? All right, now we'll talk about our lipid lowering agents. This is gonna be the, the bulk of the, the topics here today. So um, we do know that there's two sources of dietary fats um, that come in, um, and we'll mainly be talking about either ways that we're endogenously producing things like cholesterol and then also our dietary intake. You see that as far as exogenous lipids that are coming in, we see them either uh, being ingested as triglycerides or as cholesterol. So it's kind of your typical American daily diet. It's probably been changing as time goes on. Our diets continue to get worse and worse uh, to some degree. And what you end up seeing is that the triglycerides and the cholesterols are being ingested and being um, uh, metabolized. You're going to see them being incorporated into these things called chylomicrons. Have you guys covered any of this cholesterol? Okay, good. So you'll at least be uh, probably ahead of me in this in some regards. So we'll go over the pertinent points as far as it uh, refers back to the, the drug mechanisms of action. But anywho, what we're seeing here is that you're, either your uh, dietary cholesterol is being uh, emulsified by these bile acids that are being secreted. Um, you also have this biliary cholesterol that gets reabsorbed eventually through the, the enterocytes. But essentially what we're seeing is that they're being incorporated into these chylomicrons. And those are kind of the, the precursors to things like our LDL cholesterol um, and all the, the precursors of even before that. It's so like VLDL and IDL and things like that, which we'll talk more about. So essentially what we're gonna be getting into, and I just wanna, kinda wanna cover the, the broad strokes here as far as how these, um, how these different cholesterol uh, components are, are being regulated and how they're being made, because this is very important as, in regards to how our drugs are gonna be working. So again, the dietary fats being carried by these chylomicrons, right, and being secreted from these intestinal cells. Um, We'll show you some pictures of what they look like in a second, but basically what you're having is that um, you'll have these triglycerides in the core of the chylomicron, and they eventually get metabolized by this lipoprotein lipase. And that's a really important enzyme uh, for metabolizing these guys. Eventually, you'll see some of the remnants of the chylomicrons being um, processed through the liver by these LDL-like receptor proteins. Um, and then really the big thing here is that some of those can be eventually uh, spit back out through the, the bile salts where they can then be reabsorbed. So we talked about enterohepatic recirculation, right? mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. So anytime anything is being spit out through the bile, they can eventually be reabsorbed. That's that enterohepatic recirculation. So that's kind of what's going on. So we're kind of recycling some of the, the, the lipids that we're um, spinning into the GI tract in order to help kind of emulsify and, and to process the things that we're intaking through our diet. So what's happening is once we have um, carbohydrates and the fatty acids, they can then be converted over into these triglycerides. And then what you end up having coming out of the, the liver is you can have these um, 
these very low density lipoproteins. And these are very high content of triglycerides. Um, and eventually what you're going to be seeing is that they will have things like um, the lipoprotein lipase kind of start to metabolize these off uh, until eventually you end up in these intermediate density lipoproteins. You start to see the, the triglyceride content start to go down in these as the cholesterol content starts to increase. And I'll show you a slide that kind of compares those. Um, once the IDL is being removed through the low density lipoprotein receptor, um, it can be removed that way. And again, the LDL receptor is going to be really, really important for a lot of the drugs we're going to talk about. Because our main thing that we want to do is increase the number of those LDL receptors. That's going to be really important for our therapy when we talk about it. Um, but eventually, once you get down to a low enough kind of triglyceride content, you're going to end up having these LDLs, right? And LDL, again, that's going to be mainly um, our, our cholesterol of concern, because again, what does it lead to? If you end up having like you know, metabolism with the LDL, like, yeah, atherogenesis is basically the big thing we're worried about. We're worried about plaque formation, we're worried about um, cardiovascular disease, and that's really where LDL comes from, because when it gets oxidized and, and goes to the macrophages, that's when you can start to see them causing the oxidative damage and leading to, to deposition within the endothelial cells. So again, don't memorize this slide, but just to kind of give you an idea of the comparison here, you can see that the triglyceride content of the chylomicrons is obviously the highest, being kind of a 10 to 1 ratio with your cholesterol. But as they get metabolized through things like lipoprotein lipase, the triglyceride content is going to go down. Um, and so we'll actually end up seeing that some medications are going to be better for um, treating say like an isolated hypertriglyceridemia, and we'll see other ones that are going to be better for doing things like processing the, the low density um, lipoproteins. Um, so we'll end up seeing um, that we can target different components of the cholesterol based on the type of medication we're using and their mechanism of action. And then obviously you have your HDL, which are going to be kind of our more protective um, uh, cholesterol component there, and we'll end up seeing uh, some of the medications that can actually work towards leading towards increased HDL content, which is going to be good for us. Again, just a picture of the uh, the apolipoproteins. lipoproteins, kind of the, those are really the things that are interacting with things like your LDL receptors and whatnot. And those are the important components for processing um, a lot of these uh, different molecules through the liver itself. So those apolipoproteins are important there. And if you have mutations in those, you can actually end up seeing some pretty significant changes and or alterations of your cholesterol contents um, based on that. I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Um, Again, so these LDL particles are being uh, basically coming about from the production of these IDLs, which again come back from the very low density lipoproteins. And that ApoB100 is really the important uh, apolipoprotein that's uh, interacting with our LDL receptors. That's really the important one there. Um, you can see that the LDL receptor is important because it uh, basically processes about 75% of the LDL within the bloodstream. And so if we have more of those, we can process more of the LDL and it's going to be better for us because you lead to less atherogenesis. Um, but after you know, a period of time, you know, just like any type of receptor, if you have too much of something around activating receptors, what do they like to do? Upregulate or downregulate? Down. Yeah, they eventually downregulate. So that's really the problem here is because when we have so much LDL receptor activity that they're going to end up leading to downregulation, and thus less of it's going to be processed, the LDL is processed through the liver, and thus you have accumulation, and then that's when you have the arthro atherosclerosis start up, right? So we want more LDL receptors, we want more processing through the liver of these LDLs so that way we can get rid of them. So just to give you an example how that apolipoprotein is interacting with that uh, LDL receptor. It gets taken into the, uh, you know, the hepatocyte. You can process whatever you need. You can take out things like amino acids or whatever else you, know, you might need throughout. And eventually that, um, the LDL receptor is going to get recycled and put back into the, basically the surface of the cell. Um, so again, we want as many of those as possible. So anything we can do to increase upregulation of that is going to be um, better for helping to process even more of those LDL particles. So just to give you an example, um, sometimes you'll have uh, actually mutations in the LDL receptor pathway. So you can have this uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And you see that even um, you can have one or two mutant genes that can happen there. Um, and what you end up seeing is even if you have one gene being non-functional, you can end up seeing cholesterol being twice as high as it normally would otherwise. Um, and you can even see patients who have their uh, cholesterol as high as 1,000 milligrams per deciliter, which is quite high. So look at some of the normal <laughs> values here in a little bit later. Um, so just keep in mind that you know those, uh, there's genetic predisposition to some of this stuff, um, but some of the medications you'll see will work directly to help increase the, the activity of this pathway. Okay, so typically what you're going to end up seeing with your cholesterol, it can kind of range from person to person, but typically you see that uh, the majority of the content is going to be made up of your LDL. 
Um, you'll see the HDL is going to be around 20 to 30 percent of your content, and then uh, your VLDL um, is about the remaining 10 to 15 percent. And so that's where when you're measuring your triglycerides. A lot of it's coming from that VLDL content, right? We'll talk about how you actually calculate that out when you're getting your total cholesterol. Um, but essentially, you know, uh, you see a lot of chylomicrons and remnants and things like that after ingesting a fatty meal. But when you get back down to resting state, this is kind of where you're going to be sitting at. So, um, what are some ways that we can get rid of all this LDL that's causing all this atherosclerosis, right? So there's many different pathways that we can go to. So one of them would be, well, what if you just inhibited the amount that you're intaking through your diet, right? That'd be really good. So a couple of different ways you could do that. One, you can actually block the actual intestinal absorption of the, uh, a lot of the cholesterol and things that you're intaking through your diet. So that's where something like azetamide would be working. We'll go into more of these in detail a little bit later, but you can have things like bile acid sequestrants to actually bind up. So a lot of those bile acids and, and a lot of those uh, bits of cholesterol within the actual GI tract, and you actually just um, excrete those out through the feces. And you'll see a lot more of them actually working within the liver itself to help um, uh, either lead to uh, lower amounts of triglyceride uh, being formed and, and changes in the LDL uh, actual receptor um, uh, Lost my train of thought. More LDL receptors being uh, put on the cell surface. Dr. Kehoe is just so distracting. So anywho, um, you'll see these are the different classes that we're going to be talking about. So we'll have first uh, the main group we're going to talk about, and this is going to be your go-to drugs for hyperlipidemia, is going to be your HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. This is going to be your statins, as they're otherwise known. Um, you'll have your cholesterol absorption inhibitor, that's azetamide. Um, you'll have your fibrates. You have bile acid sequestrants, and then the last one we'll talk about is nicotinic acid. And the thing that you'll be able to take away from this when you're done is one, to realize that one, statins are your kind of king in this uh, group of drugs here. Um, we'll talk about the, the latest guideline recommendations. But the other thing is you'll see that, you know, for a patient who say has a isolated hypertriglyceride count or hypertriglyceridemia, there's a particular drug you can try to use to help get those down. Or if they need their HDL raised, there's other drugs that can work to, to help influence that. So you'll see that not one drug is going to be perfect for every patient, but we'll see in, in which cases those, those will be useful for them. <coughs> so first group we'll talk about is our HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, otherwise our statins. You see the, the list here. These are obviously pretty easy to pick out of a list since they all end with statin. Kind of nice, right? Um, Probably the newest one is this Livalo or this Pitavastatin. Um, that one I've not actually seen much in clinical use yet, but again, I'm not um, out there in the adult world so much uh, as I used to be. But certainly a lot of these other ones um, you will see used to, to some degree. Um, certainly things like Rosuvastatin, Atorvastatin, Simvastatin are probably going to be some of your three big ones um, you'll see being used uh, pretty frequently. So essentially what these are going to be doing is working within the liver itself and it's basically work this process of generation of cholesterol and it's inhibiting this enzyme as you might imagine the enzyme is HMG-CoA reductase by inhibiting that you prevent the eventual formulation of cholesterol okay so it sounds good what is that actually doing for us so uh, essentially what's happening here is you have decreased cholesterol synthesis within the hepatocyte. Like if you're looking here on the left side of the screen, you're having decreased amount of cholesterol synthesis. You have decreased amounts of intracellular cholesterol. So that signals your cells saying like, hey, I don't have enough cholesterol here. I need to get, I need to intake more cholesterol. How's it going to do that? Well, it's going to do that by putting out more LDL receptors. If I have more LDL receptors that are sitting out there on the, uh, the hepatocyte, I'm going to be able to take in more LDL. So that's one way of doing that. Um, you're also decreasing the amount of uh, VLDL that's sitting out there and, and IDL because, again, all those things are being kind of uh, taken into the, the hepatocytes because, again, they're getting that signal that I need more so they can uh, use their normal cell processing for, for that. There's also this idea of all these other pleiotropic effects of statins. So um, what they're kind of finding out in the literature is that, yeah, it's nice to get your LDL down, but that's not really the whole story. There's lots of other things that your statins can do for you that are, that are good. And so these other kind of beneficial effects are considered to be pleiotropic effects. Um, kind of a fancy word to use for your friends. I think you're really smart when you use that. But anywho, um, some of the things you'll see uh, here is that, one, you're going to have improved endothelial function. You're going to have uh, stabilization of these atherosclerotic plaques. So again, instead of it being more kind of a labile, more likely to to have you know uh, embolism pop off of it, um, it kind of stabilizes the plaques to make them more um, more stable. There, it's going to inhibit some of the effects on on vascular smooth muscle growth. It's going to decrease um, things like platelet activation. Um, have kind of antithrombotic effects, which would be good because again, that's helping to lead to less um, 
less uh, thrombus being formed and less, you know, clotting, uh, clogging off all the arteries, um, less leukocyte adhesiveness, um, better blood pressure effects in some cases. Um, you can see, you know, enhanced angiogenesis. So really all these really good things um, that's happening that aren't really related necessarily to the effect that it's having on LDL necessarily, um, but there's just these other beneficial effects in which we don't know the full mechanism of, but we do know they happen based on the literature that we're seeing. So um, don't memorize this slide, um, but some of the pertinent points to take away from this um, is that one, uh, look at the metabolism of the statins. You notice the, the different enzymes that are responsible for that. Um, any particular enzymes that kind of kind of key you into anything? Nope, nope none of them at all. Yeah, CYP3A4 is kind of prominent on here. You see many of them are metabolized by CYP3A4. So this is a big one, big, big, big one uh, as far as drug interactions and food interactions go. Um, especially when you're looking at something like um, simvastatin is going to be a big one. Um, certainly um, atorvastatin, those are kind of two of your big go-to drugs. If you have anything that's inhibiting 3A4, you're going to lead, uh, what happens to the blood levels of these drugs? It's going to go up, right? And that's going to lead to more toxicity, which is what we'll talk about. It can be a big, big deal. Um, so in a lot of cases, if you know you have a drug interaction happening, you can go through and pick something that maybe isn't metabolized by CYP3A4, right? So this may be a case where something like rosuvastatin is a good option, or maybe pravastatin, or maybe even this patavastatin is going to be a good option for your patients uh, if they do have a concurrent drug. And then what's the, the most common food that's going to be inhibiting 3A4? Does anyone know? Yeah, grapefruit juice is the big one there. So anytime you're drinking grapefruit juice, you're uh, imbibing these these chemicals um, that will end up inhibiting CYP3A4. It's like Naringin is one of them. Um, don't get too hung up on that. Just know the grapefruit juice is your main food drug interaction that you're going to be seeing here with these guys. But only for the ones that are metabolized by 3A4. Right? So there are ways around this. There are drugs you can use that are not metabolized through this pathway um, that you can get away with. Right? So it's good to know that those alternatives uh, if you do have a concomitant drug interaction. Um, most of them are going to be have very minimal renal excretion, so you don't have to worry about renal dosing of these drugs, um, but you will worry about renal function in, in one particular situation, which I'll talk about just a little bit. So um, looking at what you would expect to see as far as your cholesterol levels go when you have a statin on board, um, you'll notice here in this slide that on um, these kind of downward sloping curves here, um, this will be your LDL reduction that you can typically see with the statin. So you notice, um, you know, the kind of the higher line there, you have the LDL cholesterol with a resin, and that's going to be those bile acid sequestrants we're going to talk about. Those are kind of modestly effective at reducing your serum cholesterol, but certainly your statins are going to be more potent. Um, but the other thing you can notice here is that the, you oftentimes will have synergistic effects when combining multiple drugs with different mechanisms and on your serum cholesterol. So if I were to add a statin plus a resin, which we'll talk about their mechanism a little bit later, um, you'll see synergistic effects in lowering LDL. Same thing can be said with your HDL as well. So you notice here that just by having a statin or a resin by itself, you have some modest increase in HDL, but by using both, you're going to get an even better increase. So synergy can be a good thing. Um, you obviously want to use fewer drugs whenever possible, but this is why you'll sometimes see either combination products being sold, or if you have a patient who does not get adequate results with just one drug, you can end up adding more on top of that uh, through a different mechanism and get that synergy. You also notice that the triglyceride effects can change depending on how high the patient's triglycerides are in the first place. So if you had a patient, uh, just the thing to note here is that the higher your triglyceride levels are, um, the more effective that your stats are going to be in order to reduce that. So if you look at someone who has, say, a triglyceride level of, say, less than 150, which would be considered normal, um, you have pretty, pretty wimpy kind of effects on that. Whereas if you had someone who had, say, a triglyceride greater than 250, you can have, end up having a third reduction in that. So again, the higher triglycerides are, the better the effect statins will be for that. Because again, remember triglycerides are all coming a lot, mostly from that VLDL content. And so by decreasing the amount that's being produced within the, the hepatocyte, the less um, triglycerides are being spit out by the, the liver into the systemic circulation. So the adverse effects, this is going to be the big thing for statins to know who's going to be a good candidate and who's not going to be a good candidate for statins. Um, common side effects you can see that are more bothersome than anything else. You can have sleep disturbances, headaches, fatigue. Um, hepatic issues can be a big uh, thing here. It's exceedingly rare for the most part that you end up having serious hepatic issues for someone who has no other you know, concomitant hepatic disease or someone who does not have any drug interactions here. Um, say maybe half to two and a half percent of cases. Um, but the important thing to note here is it's all dose dependent. 
So the more I ramp up my dose of my statin, the more likely I am to see some of these side effects like hepatic injury. And also, if I have a concomitant drug interaction that's increasing blood levels of my statin, you're also going to be more likely to see those interactions come up there as well. Um, so typically, you know, you will monitor hepatic function, say, at the beginning of therapy and then say, you know, a few months after you start therapy. Big thing here to note is if you start to see a rise in your hepatic function, uh, their, you know, their AST and ALT start to increase, um, you can drop down your dose of your statin and kind of wait till, for it to normalize out. Obviously, they're having a really significant hepatic injury. You may want to switch off to a different drug altogether or investigate if there's some kind of interaction happening. But for the most part, it's all dose dependent. So this will be important some of our interactions we'll talk about in a minute. The other thing that's pretty common is going to be these myalgias that can happen. So these myopathies can occur, you know, say 0.2 to 0.4 percent of patients, but this is also dose dependent as well. The big thing you worry about with these are going to be rhabdomyolysis. You guys know what that is? It's like really significant muscle breakdown, right? It's happening there. Um, don't really know the mechanism by which this is happening, um, but essentially what's happening here is that especially if you have renal impairment, um, that all that uh, myoglobin that's being released in the muscles can end up precipitating out in the kidneys. This is where you can see kidney injury, see um, uh, renal failure in some cases. So uh, it's really important to let your patients know that, hey, you know, some muscle pain is okay, but if it's like, you know, they feel like they've been lifting weights all day long and they haven't, you know, moved an inch the day before, um, they can't walk or anything like that, like those are big warning signs, right? Um, urine should also look like what? Clear. <coughs> hmm? It should be clear. Well, it should be clear, but if it looks like what? Red. If it's like, looks like tea, like they oftentimes call it like tea kind of colored, um, those are bad signs, right? So any kind of brown discoloration of the urine, like that should be a big warning sign for your patients that, hey, you're having this muscle breakdown, stop therapy right now and come get checked out. <coughs> Um, so as far as contraindications, so if they already have pre-existing hepatic disease, um, that may be a contraindication. It's kind of a relative one, so obviously the more severe the hepatic disease, the more uh, likely are to not use a statin. Um, we do recommend not using these in pregnancy because it can cause some triadogenic effects, so avoid in pregnant patients. Um, and then other relative contraindications would be things that are going to be increasing levels of your statin. So especially things that are inhibiting CYP3A4. Um, obviously if you take into that into account, you can drop your dose of your statin in order to counteract that, but unless um, you, you take that into account, you can end up with those increased levels. The other thing to note here uh, as well are include things like gemfibrozil, which is going to be one of our fibrates. Fibrates tend to increase your levels of statins as well, so that's an important drug interaction to be aware of. Um, and then also nice, and it'll be another one we'll talk about in this lecture, um, that can increase some of those, um, uh, some of those myopathies, uh, increase the risk of that occurring. You guys remember erythromycin, what does that do? Any? Yeah. Well, it kills atypicals, it's a macro lie, but what uh, specific drug interaction we're we looking at here? That 3A4, right? Remember, macro are big uh, CYP3A4 inhibitors. Okay, um, some other ones that are notable, especially for patients who presumably will have some risk for heart disease, uh, maybe put on these things, so things like amiodarone, which is a... Um, uh, which is an antiarrhythmic, things like verapamil, which is going to be an um, antihypertensive or antiarrhythmic you can see used. Um, again, note the fiber, uh, the um, grapefruit juice interaction here as well. So again, all these things can increase levels of your, your simvastatin or your, whatever your statin is, that's uh, gone through 3A4. So, you know, if a test question came up saying, you know, your patient is on a drug that's a 3A4 inhibitor, um, which one of these statins may be the best option? Be able to point out the ones that do not go through step 3A4 um, metabolism, right? That'd be a good thing to know. What are the fibroids used for? We'll talk about those in just a minute. So again, um, as far as their place in therapy, we'll look at some of the guideline, um, the latest get recommendations at the end of this lecture, but um, these are typically the most efficacious and the best tolerated of all the agents we'll talk about today. So um, really they are your go-to drugs. Uh, it's just important to make sure your patients are educated on what things to look out for, what things to avoid mixing it with. Um, and so especially if they have just elevated LDL, this is the, the one go-to drug for that. Uh, moving on, we have uh, an agent I won't spend too much time on, but this is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. Uh, inhibitor. This will be a zetamibe or zetia. This one is specifically working within the intestine to actually block the uptake of either the things like the, the cholesterol that we're spitting out in the bile salts or things that we're in intaking through the diet. So by preventing it, the actual um, enterocyte itself from absorbing, um, all the rest of the stuff will just be excreted out through uh, the feces. Um, so basically you're having less delivery of cholesterol getting to the liver itself. And so again, very similar to what you saw with the statins decreasing the intrahepatic um, 
cholesterol content, you're seeing the same thing here, it's just through a different mechanism. So again, this is gonna to lead to increased LDL receptors, um, some more of the LDL being uptaken through the bloodstream and processed through the liver. Um, and hopefully you're gonna have less, um, this will have kind of, you'll end up seeing more modest effects than you'll see with the statins, but certainly you can have some efficacy from this. Um, Again, zetamibe itself actually ends up getting hepatically uh, recirculated itself, and it's also, it has also have an active metabolite that does this as well. Um, and so it also helps to limit some of the systemic exposure you get to. So this one actually has less systemic effects, um, with side effects you would see as opposed to something like your statins. Um, you see here it's often uh, seen in combination with other drugs or so something like, you know, you can have a, a Vitorum, which is a zetamibe and semvastatin mixed together. Uh, that's one that's out there you might see. Uh, question? Yes. It's just the fact that it helps to kind of extend the apparent duration of action of the drug some, okay. and then you also see it lead to less kind of systemic effects because it uh, it's mainly just staying either in the GI tract or in the liver. It's not really getting out systemically, um, so you don't see a lot of systemic side effects from it necessarily. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to some degree. Some of it obviously will get lost in the, in the GI tract of the feces, but some of it will stick around for longer. <coughs> So um, looking at the kinetics of this, uh, nothing really uh, exceptional to point out here. Um, notice there are no SIP interactions to worry about here for this one, which is uh, a positive. Um, but notice that it does have high protein binding, so whatever does get to the systemic circulation, you could see potentially um, risk for uh, protein binding interactions, uh, which we'll also see with a couple other drugs we'll talk about today. So um, typically what you see here is that you can um, rarely to use uh, Zetamide by itself. I typically don't see it recommended by itself, uh, especially with the newest recommendations uh, from guidelines. But um, sometimes you'll see it's added on um, in order to get another mechanism working for some synergistic effects. So typically, you know, if you add it on to a stat, you may end up seeing, say, another 15 or 20 percent LDL uh, reduction uh, happening there. Again, you can take it with or without meals, so no real concern about that. Um, but just know this is typically going to be um, seen in combination with other agents. Um, typically, the worst adverse effects you're going to see maybe some GI upset, um, and in some cases you may end up seeing uh, some increases in your uh, hepatic transaminases uh, with statins. Again, it's pretty rare that you'd see that, um, but more prominent in patients who maybe already have hepatic impairment to some degree. Uh, as far as relative contraindications, um, you know, pregnancy, breastfeeding, children, usually not a lot of data to support use in, in these. Um, on these patients, but for the most part, um, you may see some increased risk for myopathy, especially when in combination with other drugs like statins, it can cause this. Um, but like I said, for the most part, it's really well tolerated. So as far as um, other drug interactions of note, so fibric acid derivatives, we'll talk about those in just a little bit, but um, one of the things you end up seeing um, is that cholelithiasis is a potential side effect from your fibric acid derivatives. Um, so when combined with this drug, you can actually increase your risk uh, for developing that, and then also that combination can increase your risk for myopathies as well. Um, You'll see bile acid sequestrants will actually end up decreasing your concentrations of azetamide, and that's due to the fact that it's binding it up within the GI tract. We'll talk more about those in a little bit. Um, then you can also see, end up seeing things like antacids decreasing your concentration, and then drugs like cyclosporin, which is typically used as a uh, immunosuppressant, um, may actually end up increasing concentrations. But it'd be pretty rare that you'd see a patient on azetamide and cyclosporin at the same time. Okay, uh, so then moving on, our fibric acid derivatives, otherwise known as our fibrates. Uh, three drugs that fit into this category, um, gemfibrozil, phenofibrate, and probably the, the more newest one would be the, the bezafibrate, or bezafibrate. Um, I'm most uh, familiar with the gemfibrozil and phenofibrate, um, but um, this other one appears to be a little bit newer agent. So these are going to work through, uh, again, a different mechanism. So essentially what these guys are doing, and the, the, the full um, mechanism isn't really well known, but essentially what they think is happening here is you're having activation of this P part alpha um, gene. This is a uh, nuclear transcription factor. So by activating this P part alpha, it's actually leading to increased fatty acid oxidation uh, within the hepatocyte, and this is leading to decreased in secretion of uh, triglyceride-rich um, lipoprotein. So that's mainly your VLDL. So increases fatty acid oxidation, decreases the amount of triglycerides are being spit out of the hepatocyte, and thus decreasing your serum triglycerides. So this is one of the big things you'll note with this one, is it's gonna have a good effect on your triglycerides. Um, other things you may actually end up seeing as well are gonna be some uh, increases in your HDL. 
So again, if you had someone who had just elevated LDL, this might not be the best drug for them, whereas if they had a, uh, you know, an isolated hypertriglyceridemia, this might be a really good drug for them. Um, as far as uh, things to note from this uh, category note, um, drug interactions are not going to be super big as far from the 3A4 um, category. Notice that you know, the visa fibrate is only about you know, a minor um, substrate of 3A4, so you don't see a ton there, but the protein binding is going to be important here, especially when you see things like interactions with your anticoagulants. Um, due to protein binding interactions, you can end up kicking some of those anticoagulants off of things like albumin, you end up seeing increased bleeding risk. You had a question? So um, if they have a high triglyceride, you know, so again, because your VLDL when you're, uh, the, basically the surrogate way to measure the amount of VLDL in the bloodstream is looking at triglycerides, right? Um, and so patients who have a very high triglyceride count, like this would be a better drug for them because it's directly targeting um, how much triglycerides are being spit out of the hepatocyte. Exactly, you're going to see that not, you can have, uh, will have some effects on LDL, because again, your VLDL are precursors to your LDL, but this won't have the most pronounced effect, not like your, some of your statins might, right? And notice all these other drugs we're talking about don't really have a lot of those pleiotropic effects that we saw with the statins. So if you're looking at the literature, looking at hyperlipidemia and cardiovascular risk, risk like statins are going to be king there, right? Because they're the ones that are best studied for this stuff, they see the best outcomes. Um, so statins are still going to be a go-to drugs, but some of these are going to be good adjuvant drugs. You can add on to that in order to get some extra beneficial effects. But in some cases, <coughs> patients who have, say, a, a genetic predisposition to having a hypertriglyceridemia, um, this would actually be a really good drug for them to go to, right? Because it's going to be able to target that directly. Um, so again, see here, uh, genfibrozole, phenofibrate, um, uh, nothing too uh, interesting there. Just uh, for your reference, you can look at the dosing. But again, I don't, I don't ask you guys to memorize that for testing purposes. Um, but looking at their lipid lowering uh, potential here, and I'll show you a chart at the end that will kind of um, summarize all this stuff here. Um, but looking at your total cholesterol, you see kind of a modest decrease there. Um, LDL, you see kind of a, a, an okay in, a decrease in your, you know, say 5 to 20 percent, so not nearly as big as something you see like the statins. Um, LDL, this is a big thing, you see a big increase in your uh, HDL there, say 10 to 35 percent. Um, but then your triglycerides are probably the claim to fame for these drugs, you know, 20 to 50 percent reductions there, right? Uh, as far as adverse effects go, you'll see mainly going to be some gastrointestinal upset for the most part, um, but the cholelithiasis is one that's going to be unique here. For whatever reason, it's making it more risk for having uh, gallstones and things like that develop. And we mentioned, especially with something like azetamibe on board as well, you see that risk even increase further. Um, and then myopathies are also uh, potential here. Um, so similarly, if you had this added on with a statin, more at risk for having those muscle pains starting up, potential for rhabdo as well goes up. Uh, as far as contraindications go, looking at pregnancy, don't want to use it because it's not really well studied. Um, if you already have severe hepatic or renal dysfunction, again, it might be a drug you might want to avoid in those situations. And if they already have existing gallbladder disease, you would not want to add this on board because, that's, again, that's going to exacerbate that further. Um, the drug interactions here are going to be big to note with the fibrate. So again, increasing the anticoagulant effects of warfarin. We mentioned that was a protein binding interaction where you can actually end up kicking uh, warfarin and things like that off of the, uh, the proteins in the serum, uh, leading to increased physiologic effects from those. Because remember, we talked about protein binding, that things that are non-protein bound are pharmacologically active. Things that are bounded by pro serum proteins like albumin, not pharmacologically active. So anything that's kicking those off to have an increased free fraction, more likely are to see this, that um, increase uh, therapeutic effect. Um, I mentioned the issue with uh, looking at things like HMG CoA reductase inhibitors and zetamibe, increased risk for uh, myopathies, and certainly with the um, zetamibe, increased risk for uh, cholelithiasis. And then with the bile acid sequestrants, you can also see some increased risk for myopathies as well, but we'll talk about those in a minute. So placement therapy, typically uh, the primary indication you'll see this is for patients that have very high triglyceride uh, levels, so say you know something like greater than 1,000 milligrams per deciliter, or they have a low HDL, that might be a good use for it. Otherwise, this is not like a first-line drug for um, you know having a high LDL content. Um, and then we'll talk about the bile acid sequestrants. So these are going to be our resins. And so essentially what these drugs are going to be doing is inhibiting um, the absorption of 
uh, cholesterol and things like that from the GI tract. So it's working similar, it does the same kind of effect as you would see with the Zetami, but instead of working at the end, at the enterocyte to block absorption, this is actually binding to it directly. So there are these resins, they're kind of um, anti-exchange resins where basically they'll just bind up the cholesterol and then just get excreted out through the feces. So what you'll see is that you really don't have any systemic absorption of these drugs, which are gonna make it um, better for patients who you know, have say uh, pregnancies or patients who are children who um, you don't want a lot of those systemic effects happening there, right? So this is gonna be kind of the preferred drugs for those situations. So again, by blocking the absorption of things like uh, cholesterol, you're going to be having less cholesterol synthesis than the hepatocyte, and again, higher LDL receptors are going to be expressed on the um, on the hepatocyte. Thus, more of that LDL is going to be taken up and processed by the liver. So again, a uh, big thing just to note here is kind of what I said already, but basically this is going to be good for patients who you do not want to absorb and have systemic effects. Um, so pregnant patients, um, children, this is going to be the better ones for them. Or if you just don't want to have systemic effects, you know, say they were having statins and they had really bad myopathies, this might be an alternative for them. Uh, three drugs that fall in this category, so you'll have uh, cholestyramine, cholestopol, and cholecevolum. Uh, usually these are going to come in um, dosage forms which are not super uh, well tolerated by your patients. So again, um, similar to when we talk about tox, uh, toxicology, you'll, um, anyone ever heard of like taking activated charcoal uh, to absorb drugs? Right. You, you do that basically by um, having a, a very big dose of something like charcoal so that way even if it's a uh, large amount of drug, you can kind of just bind it all up and, and kind of get eliminated through the feces. Same thing's happening here. So you're given relatively big doses of these drugs, so something like five grams, you know, four grams. Um, you, do, you typically are doing these multiple times a day because you typically want to do it when you're having the most amount of cholesterol within the GI tract, so say with meals. Um, and so the, the dosage forms are not super tolerated by patients, or as well as you would see with just like a tablet, right? So a lot of these are given as powders, uh, which may not be all that well taken by patients, you know, um, just like if you're taking like fiber supplements or things like that, you know, they can be kind of grainy, kind of gross. Some people just don't really like them very much. Um, so that could be an issue there. Uh, big thing to know here is that um, whereas with like things like statins, you saw a dose dependent effect on uh, changes in cholesterol. With here, you do hit a pretty hard plateau to where um, you're not gonna see a whole lot of extra benefit in binding up the cholesterol, but you will see um, increases in side effects. And as you might imagine, these don't get absorbed systemically, so what are the big side effects I'm gonna worry about? Diarrhea, flatulence, bloating, constipation, things like that. Um, typically, especially the powders, uh, again, have them mix it up with water or fruit juice. Fruit juice usually helps mask the taste a little bit better for them. Um, especially if you do like a pulpy type drink, it kind of helps mask, uh, mask the texture there a little bit more. And then um, you want to take within one hour of a meal. So that way, that's when most of the cholesterol is going to be sitting in the GI tract anyway. You can help bind that up uh, and get rid of it. Um, you do want to separate this from other medications because you will have run the risk of having those being bound up by these drugs as well. Okay. So typically what they'll end up saying is, you know, if you have a drug that would interact, you would take the drug either one hour before your bile acid questions or say four hours afterwards, right? That way it gives enough time for the bile acid question to do its thing and get eliminated before you have another interacting drug on board. So these drugs are not selected for just cholesterol? Exactly. It's going to be binding up lots of things. So again, um, not all drugs, but some drugs certainly can be absorbed as well. So like we mentioned, not absorbed from the GI tract, so these are going to have uh, big GI side effects. So like we'll have some other drugs that kind of work similar to that. Um, they again, don't get absorbed systemically, but you see very similar activities here. Um, but again, bloating, flatulence, constipation, nausea, all those are, are potentially happening here. Um, other things you run the risk of, of not absorbing very well include your fat-soluble vitamins, so A, D, E, and K. may have poor absorption there along with folic acid. Um, and other things you might actually end up seeing as a result of binding up a lot of these um, binding blood uh, the cholesterol within the GI tract, you can actually end up seeing an increase in your triglycerides. So if your patient already has high triglycerides, this would actually not be a good drug for them because you can end up seeing an increase there. Okay. Um, other things you might see, uh, these resins, because they're an exchange resin, um, you end up actually seeing calcium being bound by this as well, and so increased calcium excretion, uh, which may be a problem for patients who say like have osteoporosis and they want you know increased calcium intake. 
Uh, looking at drug interactions, again, some other ones that could be uh, have interference with absorption, so things like digoxin, warfarin. You know, these are very common medications you might see for patients who have hyperlipidemia in combination with other disease states. You know, things like AFib or um, hypertension and things like that. Um, so again, adm either administer these drugs one hour before or four hours after your bilateral is sequestered. And then looking at contraindications, so kind of absolute ones would be if they had a, a familial um, hyper uh, triglyceridemia, so if they are just, you know, have that congenital change where they're having very high triglyceride content, you do not want to administer these. Or if they have a triglyceride level above 400, and then kind of a relative one would be if they already had elevated triglycerides above 200 or so. Um, again, but if they were already, say, you know, well controlled um, beforehand, and they just had, say, an isolated increased LDL, this might be a decent option for them. So again, um, this is the safest drug to use out of the whole bunch because it's not systemic absorbed, but it's also kind of one of the more modest effects that you'll see, and it can be fairly poorly tolerated. Um, you imagine like giving this to a pregnant patient who's already having lots of you know GI disturbances anyway from from that. Um, you imagine it won't be very tolerated uh, tolerated very well by those type patients. Um, so again, it may be used in conjunction with the statin, or for those that maybe only need just modest uh, decrease in LDL. We'll continue on with niacin. Uh, this is actually a B-complex vitamin, uh, and there's also uh, basically another name for it is nicotinic acid, and essentially this can be used as an anti-lipemic. Um, there's another form called niacinamide, which you might see out there, uh, especially like an herbal supplement um, form. Um, it's actually not effective as that, so really need to be looking for nicotinic acid, niacin is really the, the things you're looking for. So a couple of different types of products. You can get some that are supplements. Um, typically, you're going to be seeing more kind of pharmacologic effect out of the prescription-based ones. So, um, and then there's also the idea of is it a immediate release or is it more uh, long-acting or an extended release? So typically, the most common one you're going to be seeing used is going to be the extended release, like the Niospan. Rx, like that's the most common one. We'll talk about why that is in a second with some of the side effects you can see here. Um, and also another form that will have uh, similar activity, although pretty modest, is going to be this inositol um, hexaniacinate. Um, that you might see as well in kind of a supplement form. So um, the way that this is going to be working is again through a uh, different mechanism completely, but again having some similar effects with some of the other drugs we're going to see downstream. Um, essentially what they think niacin is doing is inhibiting the amount of free fatty acids that are being liberated from the adipose tissue. Okay, So less fatty acids uh, are getting liberated from the tissue, less uh, fatty acids getting to the actual liver itself where they are then processed into triglycerides. So if you have a decreased amount of uh, triglycerides being formed, you will then have decreased amounts of VLDL and eventually IDL and then LDL getting formed, right? So it all goes back down to having less triglycerides being formed. Um, another thing you're gonna see with niacin as well is it's gonna have positive effects on HDL as well. So it's gonna have another good, good positive effect on HDL. Just another way of showing this. So again, decreased mobilization of free fatty acids. You're gonna have less triglycerides being formed here in the hepatocyte, uh, thus less secretion of the LDL. So looking at um, the way that this will be working, what you typically see is that the actual immediate release niacin actually is gonna be more um, effective at having its effects on, on cholesterol panel, um, but you'll end up seeing that the side effects tend to be um, not well tolerated. Uh, one particular side effect in, in, uh, that we'll talk about. Um, so say for instance you were to look at um, you know, plain nicotinic acid, the effect on triglycerides, you see a very, very big decrease there. Well, if you're using a time-release nicotinic acid, you still see good effects, but not nearly as much as you would see with the plain nicotinic acid. But again, if your patient is, you know, uh, if it's insufferable for the patient to take the drug, they're not gonna take it. So then you'll have no effects on your triglycerides. Um, but again, same thing you would see with the HDL here as well. Um, with the, the plain nicotinic acid, you're gonna see even better effects on HDL, um, less so with the, the time-released. Um, this also makes sense when you're looking at the difference in the kinetics here. So the T max, that's the, the time it takes to get to your max concentration. Obviously it's going to be a lot longer um, for that for your ER, your extended release formulation, say four to five hours versus just an hour for something like the immediate release. Um, but again, no big um, things to note here as far as, you know, SIP interactions or anything like that to, to take away from this slide. So um, 
Again, just looking at the, the drug, how it's given, typically you can see, especially the extended release preparation, you're just going to be given once a day. Because it's extended release, you're going to have activity throughout most of the day versus immediate release, you may need to give multiple times a day um, to get, you know, kind of your, your 24-hour coverage there. Yes? Yeah, uh, so concentration time dependent only really goes to antibiotics. So since we're talking about different, yeah, don't, don't worry about that concept for, for this particular topic. Um, but just know that because it's getting a, uh, it's a more extended release, it has a slow release of the drug into the systemic circulation, you see less side effects from that because it takes time for it to really hit its uh, max concentrations. So the adverse effect that we're talking about here, the, the reason why we have to have an extended release preparation is this cutaneous flushing that you have. Um, so essentially what's happening here is you're having these prostaglandins that are being formed, which will cause vasodilation and cause massive flushing that can occur to the patient. Um, so as a, as a funny story, as, which I think is kind of funny. Um, so in pharmacy school, we go on rotations too, right? Um, and so I happen to have a rotation with a buddy in Gainesville. And so we were both at family practice sites. Um, and so him and his fellow students that were there rotating decided they were going to do the niacin challenge. Where basically what they did was they took um, a big dose of immediate release niacin. They wanted to see how bad the flushing would actually be. So um, when I went to go pick up my friend uh, after he was done, they were red from head to toe, and they were so miserable. Uh, they just got done throwing up like three or four times. Um, they were, you know, hyperthermic, just massive headache. It was just miserable for them. I go, well, did you pass the challenge? They're like, no, it's terrible. So they took a really big dose of the immediate release, but we give the extended release in order to help kind of uh, tamp that down. The other thing that you can do to prevent that prostaglandins from being released and being formed uh, is by giving aspirin beforehand. So by giving aspirin, by pre-treating uh, with aspirin, you can end up inhibiting some of those prostaglandins from being formed uh, through that cyclooxygenase pathway and thus inhibit a lot of that flushing that's happening there. Along with that, you can see a lot of nausea and abdominal discomfort from this, which is again, it is um, uh, ameliorated by having extended release preparation. Um, you can also see decreased glucose tolerance. That could be bad for your you know, diabetic patients. You may see increases in their um, serum uh, glucose. You can also see increases in uric acid as well, which could be bad for patients who say have you know, gout or something like that. Um, so again, a lot of these side effects are typically going to be um, lessened with using the extended release preparation. Yeah, so anytime I say you have an impaired glucose tolerance, that means that you're going to have increased glucose levels, right? You have a question? I've not seen that personally. I'm sure there is someone out there who's had that reaction, um, but I don't necessarily. You don't see like a like a true like allergic reaction, like a lot of like swelling necessarily. Um, but it's not to say that it couldn't happen. Um, contraindications: If you did have chronic liver disease, this would be one you'd want to avoid. Um, and other things, you know, especially with the GI upset, this may aggravate things. You know, patients with you know peptic ulcer disease. Um, they have a history of symptomatic gout for that uric acid increase. Uh, that might would be one to have a relative contraindication with. Um, and then obviously with diabetes, you may have some glucose intolerance. So um, you know, if they're well controlled with their diabetic medications, you know, it may not be a big problem at all. But for some that are you know a little bit more difficult to control, this may knock them. Um, uh, you know, a little bit higher than normal. So you may need to do things like adjust their medications if you absolutely have to have niacin on board. Um, interactions, we've kind of mentioned these uh, previously, but certainly with like statins, um, bile acid sequestrants, you can end up seeing, um, you know, impaired clearance of some of those drugs, increases for risk of like myopathies and things like that. Um, the interaction with alcohol it just can increase um, some of the effects you can see here. So certainly like the flushing and the, and the abdominal discomfort, uh, a lot of those can be kind of exacerbated by taking alcohol with that. Um, and then I mentioned just some herbals here because niacin is available as an herbal supplement as well. Um, you know, a lot of other types of, of herbal supplements can inhibit metabolism of that and lead to some significant drug interaction. So th these are just some examples. Um, no, necessary, no need to necessarily memorize that list. So um, the place in therapy, it's good for patients who do have atherogenic dyslipidemia. Um, can be definitely used for combination therapy. Um, for patients who have elevated LDL.
Um, you typically will see some combination uh, drugs that are out there. So certainly you can have like Lovostatin plus Niospan. Um, you have Advocor would be an example there. Here you can notice um, pretty good reductions in, in your LDL, increases in HDL, and decreases in triglycerides. So just know that those, those combination drugs are available. So that way patients only have to take one drug instead of two. So this is uh, an important slide, I think, not to necessarily memorize the, the numbers themselves, but just maybe to look at the trends that you're going to be seeing here. So um, again, you're going to have your different components of your uh, lipid panels. So you have your total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides, and then your, your different classes of drugs here. So um, looking at this, it's important to know things that are kind of best in class. Uh, for different things. So for instance, looking at your statins, you'll notice here that they're really going to be good for your LDL, right? That's some of the highest effects on your LDL that you can end up seeing here. Um, the one for the resins on LDL might be a little kind of hyperinflated, but um, just know the cases where resins might be uh, therapeutically appropriate, especially when you have patients you don't want to absorb uh, things systemically. Um, notice the ones that have really good effects on your triglycerides as well. You know, things like the nicotinic acid and your fibrates, um, they also have really good effects on your HDL as well. Right, so those are good things to note. Um, so again, don't memorize the number, just kind of look at the trends and, and see what you can see there. Any questions on that? Yeah. So um, just to give you an idea of kind of what we're shooting for, like how do we, how do we uh, use these drugs therapeutically? How do we administer these to our patients? So looking at their lipids, I'm sure you've seen how to actually calculate all these before, but just so we're on the same page, your total cholesterol is really measured by looking at your HDL, VLDL, and your LDL, right? Um, since we don't have a good way to actually measure your VLDL directly, we use our, um, our triglycerides as kind of a surrogate for that. So what we do is, to get total cholesterol, we'll look at HDL plus LDL plus your triglycerides divided by five. Right? Someone else came with that number, but that's, that's what it is. Um, so essentially what you're going to be seeing here is that the old goals, this is the old guidelines, ATP3, um, they were actually recommending specific gold numbers for your cholesterol. So they would say, well, we want your LDL less than 100 to be optimal. You know, there are different disease states would have different recommendations, but less than 100 is good. Um, you know, we want to have your HDL high because that's protective for heart disease. So, you know, anything less than 40 would be considered low. You know, we want your total cholesterol below this and we want your triglycerides less than this. Um, those numbers have kind of gone by the wayside to some degree. Kind of the newer recommendations are really more focused on what's the patient's risk for having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and how do we mitigate that as much as possible. Yes? You add all of them together and then divide by five? Nope, you do <laughs> HDL, LDL, and then triglycerides. Triglycerides itself divided by five. Okay. Good point to clarify there. Um, so the newer guidelines are from 2013, and so essentially what they're looking at, as I mentioned, uh, is that we're looking at to treat the blood cholesterol to reduce that risk, um, which again we know is be one of the biggest causes of morbidity and mortality for, for Americans. So um, essentially what you're going to be seeing is that based on the risk factors, based on certain criteria, um, you'll either initiate moderate intensity or high intensity statin therapy for patients in one of four categories, which we'll talk about those in a second. And then we're not necessarily targeting for specific numbers of LDL. Typically what you're gonna be targeting is just how high of a dose can they tolerate. And a lot of these are gonna be shooting for those pleiotropic effects we talked about before, of things like you know, clot stabil or, you know, plaque stabilization, decreased anti-inflammatory uh, mediators, things like that. Um, now you wanna measure your LDL as you go along because you want to look at things like adherence to therapy. Obviously if their LDL is not dropping at all, you know they're probably not taking their drug. Um, and look for things like you know, intolerability and, and, and whatnot. So the four main groups that have identified to have the most benefit from statins would be those that already have clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So someone's already had a heart attack or someone's having angina, things like that. Um, if you have an LDL that's above 190, which is pretty elevated. Um, individuals with diabetes, who are 40 to 75 years of age with an LDL that's elevated, so, or not necessarily even elevated because you know, less than 100 is good, uh, but say 70 to 189 and without uh, that ASCVD. Okay, so just because having diabetes, which is such a high risk uh, factor regardless. And then individuals without any kind of uh, clinical ASCVD or diabetes, um, but they have this LDL between 70 and 189 and they have a 10 year risk factor of having some sort of cardiovascular disease of greater than 7.5%. Okay. So these are the four groups of people that if you fall into one of these, you really should be started on either uh, moderate or high dose uh, statin therapy. We'll clarify some of these in just a second. So this is a nice kind of flow chart that kind of gives you an idea of how to actually process that information. So again, basically just start out with, you know, does your patient have clinical cardiovascular disease? You know, if yes, 
probably start them on, on statin therapy, right? Um, you know, then you go to the LDL lookout, you know, if they're above 190, yeah, you should probably start that statin for them. You'll notice here that uh, a lot of cases that the differentiation between high dose and moderate dose is gonna be their age uh, and how well they can tolerate the drug. Because again, we said the side effects can be, you know, you know, generally statins are well tolerated, but you know, if they're having the myopathies, if they're having hepatic um, enzyme increases, you know, they may need to have lower doses in order to help tolerate that. Uh, again, they have diabetes, you're gonna be looking at, um, you have diabetes and they had the LDL within that range, like we mentioned, which most of them should. Um, you go ahead and start the statin therapy at the moderate uh, category. Um, I'm not going to make you memorize whether they need high or moderate, uh, but I will say, you know, if you have a patient who is, say, you know, uh, 60 years old and he has diabetes and his uh, LDL is 200, should you start statin therapy or what would be the best drug for him to start on? Like, that might be a type of question I might ask. And then how do you figure out what that, that risk actually is? Uh, how do you figure out they're bigger than 7.5%? Uh, 7 um, there's calculators out there, uh, which use a number of different things. Like this one's from uh, clincalc.com. Um, you know, you'll put in their age, their sex, their race, you know, things like you know, their, their blood pressure and whatnot. And that would definitely give you a risk factor to say and within the next 10 years, how likely are they, have, are they to have one of these events, right? MI, et cetera. Does that make sense? Um, also, I won't make you memorize the doses here, but just to give you an idea of kind of the different um, intensities of the, the statin therapy, you'll note that all statins are not made equal. Um, you'll see that some are much more potent than others, um, namely a torvastatin and rosuvastatin are kind of your two go-to really high potency uh, statins. Um, so certainly if you're going high intensity, you need to use one of those two. Otherwise, if it's moderate intensity, you can get away with most any of the other drugs because it will have equivalent dosages um, that, will, that will work to get that moderate uh, effect that they're looking for, right? So again, you can always go back to your guidelines and figure out which drugs gonna be best for your patient, but just look at the relative doses here they're gonna be using uh, to have an idea. And basically you just go drive the dose as high as you can, uh, and then if the patient can't tolerate it, then you start titrating down from there to figure out what they can tolerate. Um, so again, look at your potential side effects, look at your drug-drug interactions to make sure there's not going to be anything there that's going to preclude them from getting therapy. Um, and again, just use a maximum dose tolerated by these patients. So if they can't tolerate the, the dose is recommended. So any questions on hyperlipidemia? Yes. Um, well, you typically are not going to be titrating up necessarily. So like th those are like the maximum recommended doses um, based on studies and whatnot, based on the recommendations. As they start here, they can't tolerate it and go down from there, but you wouldn't necessarily say bump it up unless maybe their risk factors change or something changes, then they need, may need high dose um, therapy instead, right? So again, the point is you're not necessarily treating the numbers necessarily, but you're more uh, just looking at getting the statins on board because we know that those have good mortality benefits um, and decreasing your risk for cardiovascular disease down the road. Um, so it's not that we care what your LDL is necessarily, we just know that by having these high dose drugs on board, um, you're going to be more protected, right? So then you might say, um, you know, if you had a patient who had just, you know, elevated triglycerides by themselves, you might use a different type of drug than say just a statin. So say something like niacin or something like uh, a fibrate or something might be better for those patients, right? So this is where you're going to start to see some of the changes in therapy, you know, um, so it's a di very different mantra than what it used to be when you're just targeting certain number of values. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the next section.